What's up, Whittier? Welcome to What's Up, Whittier, a homegrown podcast. A podcast to showcase Whittier's businesses, personalities, and hidden treasures. Hey guys, producer Christine here from What's Up, Whittier, and I'm here with Daniel Gomez from the Whittier Uptown Association to talk about Whittier's first uh, vegan fest. So, hey Daniel, how you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. So yeah, let's get a little bit more information about the Vegan Fest. Why are you guys doing a Vegan Fest? This is the first time ever. I think it was a great opportunity. People have been asking about it. Uh, and you know, a couple more restaurants in, in Uptown Whittier are actually going to open up a vegan restaurant. We have other restaurants in South Whittier as well. And I think it was just a great idea. You have a lot of followers that are saying, hey, do you guys have any vegan options? And I said, you know what? I think there's enough people, there's enough community here for support for the vegan lifestyle. And I know you might think, vegan uh it's not about that it's about enjoying good food with great people and they're very welcoming to say hey you know what like, we understand you're not vegan but here try this and if you're up for good food i think it's a great opportunity to come out and try things are you gonna like everything no but you're gonna like something and, uh, and it's got a great event on this sunday november 4th from 10 to 2 in the same parking lot that the uptown weed Deer farmer's market occurs we're actually gonna have some vendors from the same market so it, it's a big camino thing and we're going to have a lot of family events for the kids. We're having face painting, animal, animal balloons. Uh, you're going to have a henna tattoo artist on site. So come by, take a look, look around. And we have a lot of different type of vendors. We're having Zen tea. We have raw life cultivated juice. Who, who, that's for us. We have Mama's International Tamales and Papusas. We're even getting glazed donuts, which has a brick and mortar here in Whittier. Wait, 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 wait. Vegan donuts and vegan pupusas? Are you serious yeah, right yeah, now? Yeah, it's a win-win for everybody oh here. Oh, my God. I would, I'm, I'm coming, for sure. Me, Vegan Locas, she has a brick and mortar in East LA, and then she does a Mexican Latin food vegan. We, has, we also have Energy Smooth Bar, which is great. They're going to provide us with Asahi bowls. Oh, nice. Vegan ice cream. Mm. And they're doing also smoothies. Ooh, yeah, and then we brought in our kettle corn guy from the market. He, everybody, he always sells out on the kettle corn, so oh, get yeah. here early for that. California's best kettle corn, that's why. He yeah. always sells out California's best. And then our produce people, we're going to have Black Sheep Gardens Farms. They're great. They always bring fresh, great stuff. I actually buy stuff and make things on the weekend, like strawberry uh, nice. French toast. Mm. Uh, we have Sarah Gardens, a very local. SoCal Gardens, very local. She's up here in La, ha- La Habra, and she's at our market. And then we have some great sponsors also providing us with good swag bags. We have a great sponsor named Zen Tea House, which is also a vendor. Uh, they're providing us with good stuff. We have executive advertising who's going to do a lot of the filming, so we can have a you know some posts about how it went. Uh, we had Rafael Guerreras from uh, Farmers Insurance donate. We have Cooking for Health, which also donated, and we have Healthy Ways Medical Group. It's a local oh. office here on Greenleaf. They're going to be part of it as well. And then Dimension Nails. Yes, you hear it first. Vegan nail polish. Vegan Very conscious. Nail yes, polish. Yes, nail polish. Wow, that's awesome. And I think that's it's vegan because uh, they the don't way use... way to process it. Pro, they don't use uh, products, right? Right. Uh, used on animal testing right. or anything like that. That's super awesome. And, yeah, and then we have Ward Peas brand. They provided some uh, goodie bags, Jada Spice, Chicken Salt. It's great. And then Starlight Cuisine offered us some coupons they can use on their product in store. Oh, very cool. And then we have Arabon, Maggie. Maggie's going to provide you any information you might need about those products. But and I think those are vegan makeup products as well. Yeah. So, cool. All in all, I think we have a great mix of, of, of vendors right. and advertisers. And, and, and the first 100 people who, who uh, purchase something will get a free swag bag with some stuff that we have from the vendors. Oh, really? Yeah. So how do you do that? You just, um, hey, I bought this from over there. Can I yeah, get come or? over and I'll give it to you. Uh, Joanna and I uh, and I will be at the booth with information. We'll be all over the place. And we also have my nephew. Yes, I convinced him to dress up in a big carrot suit because that's our logo on our flyer. And he's going to be running around taking pictures of everybody. So you get your snap on, get your grandma on, and we're going to be here for that. Oh, my God. You guys have a mascot. You guys have vegan makeup. Yeah. You have vegan pupusas. That sounds awesome. Where can people find more information? about the vegan fest uh, you can actually go on the Whittier Uptown Association webpage and you'll see the flyer there and you can go ahead and click on that and it gives you information of the event our sponsors and our vendors and, and if you have any questions you can always reach out to us via uh, veganfest at whittieruptown.org
Yeah. Okay, cool. So vegan fest at WhittierUptown.org. And then also you guys are on Instagram as oh, yes. well and Facebook. Is that correct? Yeah, more on Instagram with the, our own uh, vegan fest uh, Instagram page. Very cool. But you can always find, find us through the, the Whittier Uptown Farmer's Market as well Definitely. or the association. Okay. We're all over there. Awesome. Well, Daniel, it was great getting to chat with you. Um, I look forward to walking around the farmer's market right now, which you can come to every Friday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the corner of Philadelphia and Bright. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your support. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Hey, guys, producer Christine here with this week's Community Corkboard Announcements. This week's Community Corkboard Announcements is brought to you by The Collab, Inc., Come to The Collab, Inc., where you can co-work with your community and collaborate. You can find more information at thecollabinc.com. Check out all of their social media at the underscore collab underscore inc on Instagram and at the collab inc on Facebook. So again, if you want any more information, please reach out to the social media and you're able to get a free tour of the space. So we are very grateful for The Collab and we hope you'll enjoy it too. Check it out, thecollabinc.com. Our next community cork board sponsor is Zen's Tea House. Go to zenstea.com where you can learn more about the teas available from Zen's Tea House. You can go to visit Zen's Tea House every Friday at the farmer's market from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So what I like to do is I like to go to zenstea.com and I just like to look at the different teas, right? So right now I found the organic Dream of Flowers tea. It looks like it's about $1.50, which that's a deal. So it says here that the origin is from Egypt, France, India. Nighttime tea, rejuvenating and restful sleep, and a stomach soothing agent. It says here, number one blend for sleepless nights. Our Dreams of Flower blend contains a perfectly balanced mixture of sedative herbs and flowers. This mix of Egyptian honey chamomile, rose petals, French lavender and Tulsi give every cup a sweet and spiced floral aroma and flavor. The ingredients are organic lavender, organic chamomile, organic rose petals, and organic Tulsi, aka holy basil. So if you'd like for Zen's Tea House to customize a blend specifically for you, please send them an email at info at zenstea.com. All right, guys, so that's really cool. I didn't know that. I just read that right now. So uh, if you want a customized tea blend, definitely contact info at zenstea.com. If you'd like more information, I'm sure you can visit their website, zenstea.com, or visit them every Friday at the Uptown Farmer's Market from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now back to the announcements. All right, so now we've conquered Halloween. We've finished, um, you know, voting. What's coming up next? Oh, yeah, there's Thanksgiving, so that's awesome. And I do know about some upcoming Thanksgiving drives, so once I get those dates, I'll put them on the podcast, and you guys will be able to contribute and help support these families in Whittier in need. Um, But for now, I have um, Social Media Sunday. So do you guys know what Social Media Sunday is? If not, definitely give their account a follow. It was created by Jenny and Pedro Villa from We Are Whittier. Give them a follow at We Are Whittier and follow their account at Whittier SMS. So there will be a social media Sunday marketplace. So all these accounts that you see on Instagram that don't have brick and mortars, well, you'll be able to meet them in real life on Sunday, November 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Gonz's Decorations, 12031 Philadelphia Street. So again, if you want, I believe, I do believe that all of their booths are sold out. What's up, Whittier will be there. We are so grateful to be able to have the opportunity to have the booth there. Thank you so much, Pedro and Jenny. If you want more information, just send them a DM. They're really awesome. Like, you know, we were recording an episode with Pedro and Jenny, and, you know, they're there answering all the messages. So they're really dedicated, and they really want to support you guys if you have a small business or anything like that. So we hope to see you there at Social Media Marketplace, and we hope you guys will become more active um, with your Instagrams and stuff, right? Very cool. After Thanksgiving, what comes next? Well, let's start the holiday season. Why not? Join the Whittier Uptown Association as they put on their Uptown Whittier Holiday Sonata. So this time, it's going to be on two nights. It's going to be Friday, November 30th, and Saturday, December 1st at 6 p.m. The reason why it's going to be on two nights is so you have an opportunity to see Santa on two nights. You know, a lot of last year, there were so many people that um, some people didn't get to see Santa, which is really unfortunate, or they didn't get to ride in the horse-drawn carriage, or they didn't get to go on the Starline City tour bus. Well, this year, you'll be able to experience that two nights in a row. There will be a vendor market on the grassy lot Saturday, December 1st. 
Again, this will be in Uptown Whittier, so you can park in the parking structure wherever as long as you hit the main drag on Greenleaf between Philadelphia and Bailey. That's where this, actually all of Uptown, now that I think about it, because it goes all the way to Hadley. The Santa's Village is going to be by Sage. And then there's the Marketplace, which is in the grassy lot. And then there are three or four different stations, I believe, where the horses will pick you up. So it'll be a really great time. Get out there for the Holiday Sonata. And if you have not had enough Christmas by that time, on Saturday, December 8th, join the Uptown Whittier Association for the Christmas Parade. I love the Christmas Parade. It's one of my favorite events of the entire year. And What's Up Whittier is actually going to be doing something special for the Christmas Parade. So stay tuned and hopefully we'll see you out there Saturday, December 8th at 10 a.m. in Uptown Whittier. All right, party people, looks like that's all I have this week for your community corkboard announcements. Your community corkboard announcements, again, were provided to you by The Collab Inc. Visit them at the underscore collab underscore inc and go to thecollabinc.com. We also have Zen's Tea House. Visit them at zenstea.com and check out all of their social media at Zen's Tea House. And don't forget to follow What's Up Whittier. Follow us on Instagram. Um, check out the Twitter, What's Up 562. Check out the Facebook for sure, What's Up Whittier. Also, give our hosts a follow. Check out Remo the Realtor at Remo the Realtor on everything. The other day, I got locked out of the Nixon building because, I don't know if you know, you need a code to enter in the evening. And I left my phone upstairs in Jesse's office. And I had no way of getting in contact with Remo and Jesse. I don't know their numbers. I'm like outside. It's the evening. I see this lovely stranger. Shout out to Catherine. Catherine, if you ended up listening to the podcast, shout out to you. And I asked her if she could Google Remo the Realtor. And I said, okay, the phone number is 562-762 and I'll know the rest. And she found the number and she called him and I got to go upstairs. So yeah, so that's how easy it is to get contact with Remo the Realtor. Um, Just Google his stuff and then maybe he'll give you a quote on your house or let him know if you want to buy a house, upgrade your house, whatever. He'll be sure to help you. And I did the same thing for Jesse J2 Architects, but his phone was on silent because he's a really great host and um, he was already ready to go, so he didn't hear the phone ring. But you can still follow him the same way. Just Google it, J2 Architects. Go to j2architects.com, at J2 Architects or anything like that. You can follow me, producer Christine, at The Singing Moon. If you Google me, I don't, maybe my website will come up and you can probably send me an email. That'd be cool. But um, if you have any other questions, you can send it to Christine at whatsupwittier.com. Have anything else you'd like us to feature in the community corkboard announcements? Send it over to us. You can tag us in it on Instagram and you can do email community corkboard at what's up with your com. And if you have any other questions, just let us know. All right, guys, this is a really fun episode. Take it away, Jesse and Remo. Whittier, Whittier. What's up, Whittier? Dun, da, da, da. Oh, there we go. There I we go. I was getting it. Don't I was worry, waiting Jesse. for that. I was waiting for that, man. So uh, we're back at it again, Woodier. Um, uh, this time we have a, another special guest. Um, man, and actually we just started talking about uh, how we're getting to our, our second year podcasting, which is kind of cool. Uh, Christine, December what? December 22nd, 2016 is when What's Up Woodier was born. Man. Good time. I feel old. Me too. No, fun stuff, fun stuff. Again, when you're enjoying it, uh, time flies, right? So... Um, so today we have a, a special guest. Remo, who do we yeah. have? We'll we have put you on the spot. Assemblyman uh, Ian Calderon. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. You're welcome. welcome. Um, I guess just to, to start off with, uh, if people don't know who you are, uh, if you could just introduce yourself uh, and, and who, what you do, I guess. Absolutely. So my name is Ian Calderon, and I am the assembly member that represents the 57th Assembly District. And it's about seven cities along with other unincorporated areas. So it's Whittier, Norwalk, Santa Fe Springs, La Mirada, La Puente, South El Monte. Uh, and then I have like Hacienda Heights, you know, East Whittier, all those different places, Los Nietos that are all in my district. I represent a little under 500,000 people. Um, and it's my job to go up to Sacramento where our state capital is and write laws and vote on laws that affect everybody in the state. And in the assembly, I am the majority leader. And what that means is is that uh, the leader of the assembly is the speaker, and underneath the speaker is the majority leader who helps the speaker uh, uh, as a leadership uh, kind of focus on priorities um, and making sure that those priorities pass the House 
uh, and get to the Senate, get out of the Senate and get to the governor, hopefully get a signature by the governor. But then also my job as majority leader is to make sure that all the members um, that are there in the legislature have an opportunity to, to work on and accomplish the goals that they set out to accomplish when they ran for office. You make it sound so easy, but I bet there's a lot of work to it, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, there, there is absolutely a lot, a lot of work that comes through it. I mean, you know, I got elected in 2012, so I'm finishing up my sixth year wow. right now. But I got elected when I was 25. Uh, excuse me, I started my campaign when I was 25 and elected just after I turned 27. Jeez. So I was the first millennial ever elected to the state legislature. And then when I became majority leader, uh, I became the youngest majority leader in the history of the state of California. And so, um, you know, I worked really hard to put myself in a position to be able to best represent my community. You know, as an assembly member, uh, no matter what, there's an amazing opportunity to represent your community. But the more that you can accomplish for yourself um, in putting yourself in positions of power, whether it's a chair of a specific committee or uh, getting into leadership like I did, um, the better... Uh, opportunities, I, I believe, that present themselves to, to really deliver for your district. And I'm a big believer in going up and having access to these resources in Sacramento and being able to bring those resources home. And um, I focused a lot on that uh, in the last six years, making sure that, you know, I'm not just representing this community in terms of my vote, my vote you know, representing that voice with my vote and, and, the, and, and what I author, but then also bringing tangibles back to the district. And that's really important to me. I think that that's the, really the value of having an elected representative is not just to represent that voice, but then also to bring things back that directly benefit the community that you represent. Wow. Before you got into politics, um, what were you doing before, the, before getting into it? Well, I was in college. Okay. Uh, I went to Long Beach State. I majored in political science, minored in communication, um, but one of the things that I grew up doing is I, uh, I surfed a lot. And so I got my first sponsor when I was 10 years old. Nice. Um, and I grew up here in Whittier. Uh, so, but I got my first sponsor uh, when I was 10 years old. And from there, I just started competing competitively. And, and um, really, I ended up choosing to go to college over really pursuing professional surfing. But one of the main sponsors that I had... Uh, was Hurley International. So as wow. I was getting ready to graduate, I started working for them, and I did retail marketing for their L.A. and Inland Empire. So basically from uh, Long Beach all the way out to um, Goleta, Santa Barbara area, and then inland to, Santa, uh, to um, uh, Victorville and you know, kind of out, out there, uh, Palmdale, that is where my territory was. And I would just manage different accounts that were kind of our VIP accounts uh, with the company. And, and I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I knew everybody in that industry. And I always just assumed mm -hmm. I'd work in that industry. But, um, you know, my, my dad has been or had been in, in government for a little while. He was the elected official for this area. He represented this area in the Assembly <laughs> and in the Senate. Uh, for you know, a little over 20 years, um, not all consecutively, it was broken up. But um, you know, so I learned the value of public service at a really early age, and so I, I always told them, yeah, there's no way I'm going to do what you do. You know, that's your thing. I got my own thing. I'm going to go down a different path. But then you know, we all inevitably grow up, and and you know, when you start to understand the impact that any government has on your life. Yep. Um, especially being a millennial where I feel like everything was just always constantly putting, put, being put on our backs, you know, and it, and it wasn't being necessarily done for us, but kind of in spite of, despite us, um, I felt like representation was really important, um, you know, for that generation. And so I, you know, I, I threw my hat into the ring and this community, uh, you know, gave me a huge opportunity by electing me to, to be their representative in Sacramento. Got it. Was your father also the same uh, assemblyman for the same area? It was a little bit different, so districts have changed. Mm -hmm. So he was elected to the state assembly in 82, and, he, and so he represented this area from 82 to 90 in the assembly and then represented it in the Senate from 90 to 98. But when he was in the Senate is when term limits came about. There were no term limits when he was in the assembly. So after he termed out of the Senate in 98, he went back to practicing law because he's a lawyer. I mean, he grew up in Montebello. He was a school board member in Montebello. He was a prosecutor for the city attorney's office in Los Angeles. 
Um, and um, and so he he always loved public service in his job being able to to represent the community in Sacramento. So what he did was, um, after practicing law, after going back to practicing law, he wanted to go back to the legislature. And so in 2006, he ran for the state assembly again, and he won. Wow. Uh, and so he served in the assembly from 2006 to 2012. Uh, and when he turned out, I took over for him. And so I, I ended up representing... Uh, becoming the representative, but the districts changed. So the district that he represented from 2006 to 2012 is now different than the district that I represent Mm -hmm. now. I mean, because... Because of the census, census, right? Well, yeah, so representation, but then also uh, we pass in California um, a a law basically establishing a redistricting commission so that there was um, an opportunity for equal representation of all communities and like communities to be represented by Mm -hmm. um, the same person. And, and uh, you know, and so for communities to be in the same district that kind of share the same values and have the kind of the same, I mean, you know, having Whittier being represented by somebody who lives on the coast, it's different. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're, they're just two very different communities. And so it was, it was about figuring that out. And, and it gets around gerrymandering, um, which is a huge issue right now that we're dealing with, not in California because we don't have that. The legislature or politicians don't decide the lines. Uh, the independent commission does, uh, but in other states around the country, they have these gerrymandered districts. But we don't have that in California because we have the redistricting commission, uh, and so this district will last for about for ten years. If I stay the whole, if I continue to get reelected, I can be in the assembly for a total of twelve years, and so my last term that I run for will be a different district hmm. than I represent now. It'll be the same area, but it'll look. Slightly different. Are they increasing the number of districts or decreasing? And getting uh, it's been the same. So there are 80 members in the Assembly and 40 members in the Senate. Assembly members are about 500,000 people. Senators represent around 800,000 people. So there's two Assembly members to every one senator. Um, so we're not, we're not changing the number of re- elected representatives. We're just changing the districts to make sure that uh, it isn't based on party registration, but more based on demographics of the communities that you live in and, and like communities that share values having the same type of representation. Got it. So if, if you know, once, say, you get reelected, when you go into your new district for the next six years, is that going to be a bigger group of people? or of Well, that considered? depends on the census um, Got it. because the census will determine, uh, you know, the population. And that's why there's a lot of fight fighting going on right now with regards to the census because – you know, there's a, there's, you know, this issue of a citizenship question, which is not on the census now and hasn't been. Yeah. Uh, and and the issue with that is is that the census isn't about counting certain groups of people, citizen or not. It's about understanding who lives in the communities or who lives in this country as a whole, yeah. regardless if they are documented or not. Correct. Uh, and, and you know, and, and when you think about somebody who's undocumented. You know, a lot of people like to say, well, they don't deserve representation. Well, let's not forget that they still pay taxes because every time they go to a business here in Uptown Whittier or anywhere else, they're paying sales tax. Yeah. And, you know, essentially, you know, we we fought our revolutionary war because of taxation without representation. That's right. And and uh, and that's what you have. And so the, this census is a really big deal um, because. What, it, what, 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 what right now, especially with adding the citizenship question, what's going to happen is that there's going to be an undercount of people. And so now you're going to have a lot of people that are living in these communities that are too afraid to come out yeah. or too afraid to say something, whether they're documented or not, for whatever reasons that they have. And they're not going to be counted. And now what that does is that throws off the redistricting because the redistricting is based on population. Yeah. And, and so – that's a really big issue that we're dealing with now. So that's why this census is so important. In the state, we've been dedicating a lot of money to getting out awareness uh, for people to understand how important it is for them to participate in the census because uh, we all count. Um, we all matter. We're all here, and we need everybody to, to be aware that they have to be counted by that census because it's going to dictate what the next um, – not just assembly and senate districts are going to look like, but then also the U- United States Congress, those houses, uh, the House of Representatives, what those districts are going to look like. So, for an undocumented person that is with the census coming up, 
with everything going on, at least in the news with um, uh, immigration, and, and what do you say to that undocumented person that is worried to say, I'm not going to go talk or I'm not going to go give my answer because I'm worried about you know, getting deported or, you know, or, or something along those lines? Well, what I would say is, is that I understand where you're coming from because I'd be scared too. Um, but the people that are working the census are not people that are going to be turning you over to federal authorities. And so a big problem that we have right now is with the leadership in Washington that they're creating this hysteria when it comes to immigration. We have a bro- broken immigration system, but it isn't because uh, we have this, this influx of illegal, uh, un- undocumented individuals coming into this country. Uh, it's that we have no path. The path right now is to come in, you know, pay five to six thousand dollars to a lawyer to help you go through the process and wait ten years. Uh, and and I don't think a lot of people have a problem with that. But when you're coming from poverty, you're coming from nothing. You're leaving a country like Mexico to try to have a better life for your family. Well, guess what happens? A lot of times they'll link up with somebody that takes their money yeah. that if they save that money up. They can't save the money, but then they save that money up, and they end up in a position where now they're they're SOL because they don't have the money to to, to move on, and so they continue to be here uh, undocumented because the system let them down. But to those that are worried about the census right now, what I would say is make sure you're counted and make sure you f- you, you fill out your survey and that you get counted because if you don't like the policies now, if you're worried now, if you don't participate, it's going to get worse. Because the representation is now going to change. You know, California could lose a seat yeah. uh, in, in, in the House because of the, po- of the population change. These are big deals. But this is exactly what Republicans, uh, you know, not to get partisan, but that's exactly what they want because that's, that's how they win. Why do you think they're so good at gerrymandering districts? They have the control of Congress right now because they've gerrymandered districts in ways that they'll never lose. Uh, and that's why the Supreme Court in, in different states – uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States just recently rejected hearing uh, these these cases uh, when it comes to upholding their gerrymandered districts because uh, they're not constitutional because they're not they're they are not representative of the actual demographics of these communities and of these states. So don't hide from it. We're going to protect you as a state. We put a lot of money, a lot of resources into protecting everybody in this state, documented or not. Um, nothing's going to happen to you, but you need to be counted because it's going to change the way our federal government looks. And if you think it's bad now, if we don't have that accurate count. States like us that are on your side, we're going to be now un- underrepresented in Congress, and that's going to significantly impact you in a much more negative way. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think this goes to whether you're documented or not documented or legally here or not legally here. Um, is that you're right. You should participate in the census because that also represents what uh, what we get as a state, right, in terms of resources, or not as a state, but also as a community, mm-hmm. like what we're allotted to uh, in, in terms of a, per, a percentage or, or, or funds, right, that come from from the feds. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think it's something that it needs to – that information needs to go out. Um, and it's something that, again, it benefits all uh, as a community, so – so if you haven't if, – when does this happen? When does the census uh, count start? It's coming up pretty soon. I can't remember the exact date, and I don't it's want to say every 10 wrong. years. So yeah. they did last one in 2010. Next one will be 2020, 2030, and there so on. There you go. Yeah, so it's coming up. So in, 20, in 2020, when 2020. Christine's still around, uh, she'll announce that the census is coming up. I got, I got you, Whittier. <laughs> You're 411. And it, it'll be done over the course of the year. Correct, correct. Um, I, I, was, I want to go back to a question of are you still surfing? Hi, Rose Riesline here, owner of The Collab, Inc. We are located in the heart of Uptown, 6709 Greenleaf Avenue. Um, We're a collaborative co-working space, the first one here in Whittier. We have undedicated workspace, private cubicles, conference room, and private offices coming soon. We also will be hosting networking events and business development workshops. So we're super excited to have our professionals and entrepreneurs come in here and co-work. The underscore collab underscore Inc. for Instagram. And then on Facebook, we are The Collab Inc. You can find out what we're all about and see our schedule of events at thecollabinc.com. You can also learn about our membership prices, fee structures, daily rates, and event space rates. We are a two-minute walk from our parking structure on Bright Avenue. Come sit with us. 
I, I was I want to go back to a question of are you still surfing? I mean, <laughs> as much as I can, yeah. man. Because you're, you're in Whittier, right? Yeah, I live here in Uptown Whittier, yeah. um, but I spend seven months out of the year in Sacramento, Monday through Thursday. So it's really difficult um, to uh, to get to, to get to the beach, you know, to find time to do it. On top, you know, not just my job, you know, but I have a one year old at home. My wife is pregnant with our second. Congratulations, so, man. Thank you. Really appreciate that. So I mean, you know, I I don't get to surf as much as I'd like to, um, but. You know, sometimes I can sneak away at 5 a.m. to get, get out early for a dawn patrol, and that kind of keeps me going. Where I, do you go surfing? It just depends on the swell. Okay. Um, you know, it's easiest and quickest to go to Huntington or Newport. Um, I have some friends that live down in San Clemente, and I'll go down to San Clemente and surf with them as well. Nice. Uh, but, you know, really it depends on, you know, the swell direction and the conditions. But anywhere between Santa Barbara and the border is, is, is – up, up for grabs if, if it's good enough. So Look, what is it the night before you hop on an app and you say, am I waking up tomorrow at 4 a.m. to go surf in San Clemente? Pretty much. It's uh, wow. surfline.com, and you can get forecasts of you know huh. the swell conditions, wind conditions. Um, you can get live webcams at a lot of the spots that you, know, you want to surf and see it live just to get an idea of what the conditions are like um, immediately uh, live. So... You know, it, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll look at the app and I'll and I'll make a determination. Okay, here here's where it's going to be the best. This is the swell direction. It's hitting you know northwest facing beach is the best, so it's going to be here, and the wind is going to be good from you know 9 a.m. to 12 noon. It's, it just there's all that type of stuff. Yeah, it sounds more complicated yeah. than just picking up a, a racquetball. And let's go ahead. The- yeah. <laughs> you and I go to the water and we go in for like a minute or two. I'm like, done. It's too cold. Yeah. I know nowadays you need to uh, you need to be a weather expert in order to predict where to go right yeah, yeah well i mean you got the information so it's like okay you want to you want to maximize your time especially for guys like me that can't yeah, do it, it all the it time it sounds right? like you your weather, weather yeah expert. so so you you need to maximize your time so this place at this time is going to yeah. be the best yeah. so where do you go get catch waves in dc well i, I go to sacramento oh so sacramento. i don't have to fly to dc so i go to sacramento oh, nice. but i don't while i'm while i'm up there the, the closest beach it would be probably Ocean Beach in, in San Francisco or Santa Cruz. Yeah. Uh, but while I'm up there, I mean, I'm it's pretty small. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I've basically um, generally from you know 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's meetings every 15 to 30 minutes, notwithstanding if I have session while, 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 I'm, while, while we're in session, you know, I'll have to show up for session. But um, I'm pretty busy. So I, I, when I'm up there, I, I got a lot of work and, and – I don't have any time to surf. See, that's when you should come in with the board and say, we're having a board meeting <laughs> oh, yeah. at the beach. Yeah. Believe me, that you know, <laughs> sometimes a board meeting might pop up on my schedule every once in a while. <laughs> Unofficial. So what does your actual schedule look like when you're just throughout the year? Is, I, I don't assume it's a nine to five. Or, no. So what, is, what does your schedule really look Generally, like? Generally, especially while we're in session. Right now we're not in session, which, do, which people think we're on vacation. No, we're just working <laughs> full-time in the district because seven months out of the year or Monday through Thursday we're in Sacramento but generally it's a full pack schedule Monday through Thursday with session happening on Monday and Thursday and then I fly home and usually it's some type of district event on Friday sometimes Saturday but Sunday is my family day and so at least guaranteed Sunday off and, and, it, and it just depends you know all the cities and the areas that I represent if they're doing an event I try to show up because I think it's important for people to not just see me and know that I'm engaged uh, yeah. But then also to come up and talk to me, especially if they have a question or they want me to know something, you know, I try to make myself available. You know, we'll schedule community coffees, all that type of stuff. And that's big. I mean, uh, especially right now with uh, with technology, right? Uh, before, you know, radio, TV, you know, you might kind of get a glimpse of, of a picture and you, know, you kind of attach a face to the voice on the radio. But now with social media, I mean, you could post a picture anywhere, right? Uh, but to be able to see you or anybody who's who's in, involved with with uh, politics uh, or representing the community, um, to be able to see them more involved in the community um, is very powerful. I mean, very powerful because you're right. Then at that point, people. I mean, especially from mine. I'm, I'm saying it from like my perspective. Like you're right. Now I could see you walking down the street, and I could approach you mm-hmm. and introduce myself, and we could have a conversation. Um, and again. Now I know that you're able to or willing to at least listen, because uh, again you're 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 very um, you know involved with the community. And again, I'm pretty sure you take all this feedback and obviously apply it to what you're doing. 
um, but it's big, it's huge. So, so thanks for for doing that and and being a part of the community. Because you're right. I mean, I've been involved with the community here, and I've seen you at, at several events. Um, and just again, how involved you are is, is good. So it's important. Keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's important, and I, I just like it. You know, most people think you know we're these these political creatures that you know go off to some faraway place and make all these decisions that yeah. you know we don't suffer the same consequences of and. No, I, I everything that I vote for, everything that I pass, everything that gets signed by the governor, it affects me too. I'm affected just like anybody else. So it's you know if we make a decision to do something, you know, I'm affected by that same decision as anybody else that I represent. And you know I think you know it's tough times right now because it's so politically partisan, uh, and I think that that's that's toxic for our democracy. Um, you know, it shouldn't always just be this Democrat versus Republican um, fight because yeah. it, get, it really gets us nowhere and it allows us to devalue ideas or devalue other people. Because if I could just say you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, and if I'm different than that, well, then your your ideas and your voice no longer matters to me. Uh, and I think that that's wrong. Um, but it's just you know, it's about being human. We all want the same thing. We just want to live a good life. Make sure our kids are taken care of, you know, our parents have some type of retirement security. School is not too expensive, so we can have, um, you know, a chance at making it in life. I mean, that's really all we want. And I believe in equal opportunity. Um, You know, as a millennial, I think it's, and I think my generation largely shares this, I'm a big proponent of what's fair and fairness. Yeah. That everybody has the same equal opportunity to accomplish their goals uh, and achieve their dreams. And, um, you know, and I, I approach myself and, and my work in that way. Uh, but you know, there's just, there's just too much, um, at stake to always boil things down to this red versus blue type argument. Um, because you know, we're all in it together, whether we like it or not. Uh, and you know, I may not know somebody, but their life and how they're doing in their life does affect me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I need to care. I need to care about that. And so yeah. we want compassion uh, in government. And, you know, we're all human. And, you know, we just want to do what's right. I just want to do what's right. And the best way for me to be able to best represent my community is to be out and talking to as many people as possible yeah. so that I can take that with me into the decisions that I make. So going into this coming uh, election, what do you think some of the biggest issues are that either are spoken about or maybe not spoken about that people should know of stuff that's going on? I think voting. You know, midterm elections are generally elections that people don't show up to vote for uh, because it's not a presidential election. You get high voter turnout for presidential elections, but it is so important to show up and vote in every election because what's happening is, you know, there are school board elections, city council elections, state representative elections, and congressional, uh, federal uh, elective elected mm-hmm. positions that are up um, and all those people that are getting elected are in some way going to affect you and determine what your future or your kids future is going to look like and you know um, you know for those of you who like Star Wars I always like to say in the absence of light <laughs> you know evil mm-hmm. prevails yeah. and, and, and grows and, and so the more that people show up it's an accountability for those that are being elected and that are elected yeah. uh, and you know, you get a, uh, an opportunity to pick somebody and vote for somebody that shares your values. You know, we all want to be able to to have the specific future for ourselves and for our families. But you're not going to get that if you're not electing the people that share those values. Because yeah. then they're going to start, you know, implementing the future the way somebody else sees it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people just seem to think that their vote doesn't count. You know, I think a lot of men, millennials have been apathetic when it comes to voting. And not because they don't care. I mean, you're talking about the most educated generation in the history of this country. That's stupid, even though we get called stupid all the time. It's not that we don't care. We care. Our generation volunteers and is, and is civically active, uh, just like the greatest generation was, you know, more so than our parents' generation. The only difference is, is that I think millennials focus more on this instant gratification because that's the world we've grown up in, you know, where we do something, there's that immediate uh, return. Where voting isn't like that. Government is not like that. It's like you vote. The immediate return is, is in the hope that the person that you like gets elected. But then the change takes time uh, because change happens over time and it's incremental, especially within government. And we just need 
uh, younger folks to show up and vote, people you know from these next generations, millennial generation, Gen Z, uh, because their futures are being determined by people like myself, uh, and they need to have a, a, a say in what that future looks like. And I, and I think that they want to say in what that future looks like. And we're seeing signs right now, uh, like take Orange County, for example. Uh, we have people that are turning in their mail ballots, right? Well, 60% were from voters 65 and older in Orange County. Well, over the last couple of weeks, that number has dropped to 40%. Wow. And the reason why that's dropped is because people that are younger between that 18 and 40 uh, age range, they're starting to return their ballots. Mm. And so this is really encouraging. And, <clears throat> you know, there really needs to be no difference between a presidential election or a midterm election. Everybody needs to show up and vote for every election. Uh, but we're just not going to get the change that we need until more people show up uh, and vote. And it really is. Um, you know, question of do you like the way things are going right now or do you not like the way things are going right now? Do you believe that the values, uh, you know, of, you know, what we're seeing coming out of Washington, D.C. are your values, are our American values? Uh, well, then you're not show, showing up and vote is going to preserve that. Yeah. You know, maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you're not. I'm not. Uh, and so I'm not just talking to my – I'm not just – holding myself accountable by showing up and vote. I'm talking to everybody in my family and everybody that I know yeah. make sure that they go up and vote. And that's what it's, it's on all of us. Uh, and um, this election, it really is a very important election for our future. You know, it's uh, interesting that, or I'm glad you mentioned about this whole separation about red and blue. Um, Cause you're right. I mean, I've always, I, I'm not very, I'm not into politics as much as I should be. Um, but the people that are around me, some are more involved than others, and obviously the ones that are more involved, we always have this discussion about how the red is doing great and, and the blue is doing bad, and then I get the blue, how the blue is doing well, and the reds are doing bad. And I'm always telling the same thing. I go, why are we so, like, red against blue? Like, it's like we're almost putting ourselves in a, in a gang situation, right? Like like red against blue, you know, or whatever, you know? That kind of mentality of, like like, we're better than you. And and I, I'm always telling the same thing. I said, I think we, we both, are, actually all of us, are in the same boat where we want to do great. We want to do good. There's a reason we're involved with politics. Um, and if you just take that spirit of, of wanting to do great, that passion of wanting to do great, and you set aside those indifferences, I think we'd be in a really good situation. Um, I think it's going to change. Uh, and, and you're right. I think it's all uh, based on the demographics, the younger demographics that are coming up. Just because, like you said, I think the the voting or the younger generation, I say younger. I mean, I, I should be including that same generation. But no, it's, it's, Christine's right? generation. It's Christine's generation. Um, <laughs> you're right. There, there's a, It's a different way of working together. Um, it's more of a collaborative spirit. Um, it's about working together to be able to push certain things through. Um, but again, it's agreeing or coming to the agreement that whatever they're going to push forward is the right thing for them at that moment. Um, and which is different. It's a different thinking of what our, our parents had before. Right. Um, and so I think it's going to be a change. You're right. I think it's going to be a slow change, but I think I, I'm like a, a, what do you call it? A, a, a positive thinker here. I'm hoping that things go. You're a cockeyed optimist, as they say in politics. Opt I say optimist, or but optimist, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, everybody Everybody talks about, you're right, like, like the younger generation wants instant gratification. I think our government will eventually get there. Um, I won't be surprised if, if we have more um, social media uh, involvement for voting. Because, um, again, everybody's carrying a cell phone. I mean, how can you not track, I mean, how can cell phone companies track customers through their phone, yet the government can't help us use that same system to track voters who are registered and not registered to kind of get us in that in that poll, right? Well, so you know, voter, voter participation is important, and I'm, I'm holding up my cell phone for all those that are listening. Being able to get people to to uh, be fully engaged is whenever we get to the point where we can allow people to vote on their cell phones. But that's difficult because I'm working on this, yeah. and this is why representation matters. I'm working on this. Um, you know, you need to make sure that it is secure. Uh, and, you know, you know, first when it comes to registering to vote, let's just be very clear. You cannot register to vote in the state of California unless you are a citizen. You can't. That's why you don't need to bring an ID when you show up and vote because you're, you needed to be a citizen and verify a citizenship in order to register. Yeah. So you shouldn't need that ID. 
Correct. And, and it's an intimidation tactic that a lot of people like to use, and, it, and it's always centered, centered around uh, communities uh, of color and minority communities. And they like to intimidate them by saying, oh, show your ID, as if they've done something wrong, because you never know. Yeah. You, know uh, you know, you have somebody who goes and, you know, is a laborer, works every day. You're not following what the laws are and, and what the law is. You're just living your life. You want to show up to vote because you know you're registered, but, oh, wait, you know, they're doing this other stuff. Maybe, maybe I, I should just avoid it because I don't want to make myself susceptible to any trouble. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, it's like one of the things that I'm looking at is blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is the technology that enables, you know, cryptocurrencies, yeah. you know, yeah. like uh, Bitcoin uh, to exist. And, and, it's, and it's virtually an impenetrable uh, – it's a digital ledger that's impenetrable because you don't – there's just not one point or source. Millions of copies of it. Exactly. You can't just hack one piece of it. You have to hack the whole thing yeah. in order to, to break into it. Uh, and so, you know, I'm working with the Secretary of State, uh, and he's been doing some of this work for the last year, figuring out how can we develop the technology that allow us to register, uh, not just be registered, but to vote uh, from our phones. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think blockchain technology can lead us in that direction. But it yeah. takes time to figure it out because we we got to get it right. Yeah. And um, as much as I want to be able to do this now – we cannot make this. We can't allow this to be susceptible to any type of manipulation, yeah. uh, because you know this is this is a virtue of American democracy is the security of your vote, yeah. uh, and and it just doesn't help to when you have uh, political demagogues, you know, like the president making claims that you know three million people legally voted in California when no, they didn't. You have no proof, and it's not possible. Yeah. So. Do you know about – I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But in, in 2020, we will be able to vote on our phones. Do you know anything about the VSAP process um, that's going to be in L.A. County? Is that kind of what you're talking about? Um, I, look, I know – and we've been working with the county to try to update uh, their voting systems and how they vote. Um, there are – like you know, the um, Denver City Council, uh, the city of Denver, they were going to use blockchain technology to have a – um, a vote done, you know, by cell phones. They ended up canceling it. I don't know why they ended up canceling it, but I know they ended up canceling it. Uh, so there, there will be different localities, but you know, when it comes to uh, th- that, are going to go in that direction and try to get there. But in terms of a state, in order for us to to get there to make sure we believe it's secure and we're going to pass some type of law allowing it uh, statewide, we need, there's a certain process that we need to go through. Uh, but I know Dean Logan, who's the county recorder, registrar recorder, uh, he's working on a lot of different things because he cares a lot about voter participation uh and so uh, i know that he's been busy working away at trying to modernize voting in, in la county and to make it not just uh easier but you know more secure in your mind when do you think we would actually be able to vote on the phone Is i mean i i think it, out? i think it could be a matter of years um there's just a lot of testing and and, and it's not like it's difficult because you need to have the, the government be able to verify it, but it takes us time in order to do that and working. It's got to be a public-private partnership working yeah. with these companies. And part of the problem is is that I just passed a blockchain bill defining it. Well, before, a lot of these blockchain companies have fear of operation because there was no, there was no uh, regulations around them. And so they came to me and were like, hey, can you help us with some type of regulation, at least define what blockchain is? That way we have this comfortability to operate as a business in the state uh, because they, they were really fearing the federal government coming down hard on them if there yeah. was no type of state regulations that protected them. Um, and, and so, you know, that just got signed this year. My bill just got signed this year. And so now we can continue on the process. But, but it, it, I mean, look, we're a state of 40 million people and counting. That's more than the entire country of Canada. There's about 36 million people in the, in the country of Canada. Wow. So, um, it just takes a little bit of time because everything we're doing is just on such a larger scale. But you know, uh, myself and other members, we're 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 pretty uh, steadfast in our commitment to 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 move us along as quickly as possible. Nice. So, so here's a fun fact: I used to work at the Register Recorder in the IT department. Oh, cool! And I know Dean. Um, and so one of the the things, and this was probably. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, well, probably 15 years ago, um, the the authenticating that the election happened is the biggest re- probably responsibility of the of the is the register, right? Mm-hmm. And um, as we were talking about this, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, we are so far from it, but unless there's some crazy advancement like the the crypto um, currency, how they can validate that, 
because no matter what, it doesn't matter how clean every election is, there's a thousand people saying there's fraud, there's this, there's that. So um, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, we're so far away from that, but um, I'm glad to hear that it's only maybe years. Well, I mean, you know, and and it's all just noise. There's not, there is no fraud. It's not happening. Um, And, you know, the bedrock of, of, you know, our democracy is, is the sanctity of that vote. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, the people that died and continue to fight and die in order for us to have this democracy and to live free and have this opportunity to vote. Um, but also, I mean, that also kind of brings it, you know, to another level. And, and, and another point that I want to make when it comes to leaders and why it's important to vote is, is that, you know, leaders aren't people that sit there and listen to people uh, that have, um, you know, certain motivations to spread misinformation or disinformation to scare people uh, and to play into that. You want a leader, you want leaders in government that set the tone uh, and, and, you know, lead you down a path and in a direction of what's reality versus what's just fear being stoked for whatever political mm-hmm. yeah. uh, advancement of that individual group or individual politician. And, and right now you just have, you know, you know, the president and other folks within Congress that are trumpeting this idea that there is voter fraud and, you know, undocumented individuals that are voting when it's just there's no evidence to prove it. I mean, and his entire commission failed and was disbanded because they couldn't find any evidence to prove it other than just saying, oh, well, it's happening. Well, that's not good enough. And we all need to show up and vote because we need people to be elected that aren't going to play into that. Sorry, bullshit. And and that they're 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 going to make the decision based on what, make their decisions based on what reality is and what the facts are, not based on whatever might be politically advantageous to me that I can, you know, use to scare people or to make people angry to show up and vote to keep my party in power. I mean, that's that's not political courage or leadership. You want leadership that is going to do what's right um, all the time because that's what their job is. And on top of that, I mean you. All that energy that is being put, energy and effort that's being put to, to debunk or or you know falsify you know these these myths that you know there was fraud in this in this election or any election or the process. If you were to redirect that to stuff that should start happening and start being done for the for everybody else from the community, I mean, I think we're better off just letting it go and move on, right? Like just. Pick up and go, and, and let's get this thing going. You know, it's, uh... but, but here's the problem with politics, and this is why politics is so difficult. Reality isn't reality. Perception is reality. Yeah. So in my world, it isn't whether I can prove whether you did it or not. I just got to say it. If I say it, well, it could be true. Yeah. And if it could be true, in my mind, it might as well be true. In a lot of people's minds, it might as well just be true. Yeah. And, and the problem is, is now once you go and defend it, now you look guilty of it. That's right. And, and that's the difficulty in politics yeah. is that, you know, it's not about it, – it's about moving the conversation in a direction as to here's what the facts are. But it's really easy when somebody's making a false accusation against you or about a policy not to go like, no, that's not true because this is why. Well, guess what? You're not going to commit – convince a lot of people uh, otherwise necessarily uh, by trying to, to, to defend it because – it takes a lot of time and energy to defend it. Yeah. it, much more time and energy than to make the accusation. That's right. So what you do is you just make the right choice. Yeah. And you say, I made this decision, and I made this decision because of these reasons. Yeah. I'm not going to justify this nonsense with an explanation because it's not true, yeah. and, and you, should, you should know when somebody's feeding you nonsense. Yeah. Uh, and as my job as a, as a legislator and as an elected official, it's my job to be able to just look at that and be like, Okay, that's obviously not the case. We're going to continue to move in this direction yeah. and and to bring people along with me down the path that's the reality rather than allowing people to go down this rabbit hole because if I go down that rabbit hole, well then people that that follow me or that listen to me or listen to elected officials, they're going to go down that rabbit hole too and we're just you got to not do that. Yeah, yeah. And and that's true leadership. I mean, it's one thing if you're leading, you have to just be confident and, and know what it is your the direction you're heading to. And you're going to get stuff that's probably thrown at you every day that's going to try to pull you in a different direction. But what you said about um, once it's there, you start defending it, then you look guilty. I mean, that's that's so true. And a lot of these tactics are that 
where mm-hmm. they just you know get drop these little things and almost distract you from other things that are going on. So well, and if you watch Trump, he's a genius at this. He's a genius yeah. of distraction and misdirection. Yeah. But he's a genius because he also understands the way media works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because if he says something ridiculous, guess what? Now they're just going to talk about what he said that's ridiculous. And it's going to fall by the wayside, whatever policy thing he's doing or whatever else he's working on. Because, oh, he said this. Can you believe he said that? Yeah. And that's a problem with media nowadays is that it's, 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 it's so vital. It's so important. But the focus needs to be on here's the reality. Here are the facts. Yeah. You make a decision for yourself. Don't be trying to make up my mind for me. Don't try to, you know, because that's where people start to pull away is when they feel like they're being fed information uh, as opposed to allowing themselves to have the facts and make up their own minds for themselves. Um, But, you know, leadership is about knowing when to listen and knowing when to lead. Uh, And, you know, I I just feel, I don't, I don't just feel, I know there, there is a lack of leadership in Washington, D.C. And it isn't. And it goes so far beyond just the terrible policies that are being proposed and being passed. It's it's our position in this world. Yeah. We are a moral leader. We we've held this moral high ground. The office of the presidency has held a moral high ground that we are now giving up because people can no longer uh, believe uh, in our ability to do what's right because it's the right thing to do because that's the American value. Now it's about politics and it's about this um, you know ability to stay in power. That's driving the conversation, not what's right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to get into uh, into local, into our local area, which is Whittier. Um, of course, we're going to be a little biased, everybody. Um, well, what is it, talking about leadership, what, is, what are you kind of spearheading here in Whittier or, or something that affects Whittier uh, and based on what you're working on now? Well, I said earlier how it's really important to me to go up to Sacramento where I have access to these resources and to bring those resources home. Uh, And so every year what I do is I reach out to all the cities that I represent and I say, hey, are there projects that are important to you uh, that maybe I can try to find some funding from the state budget to do? Uh, And and this year uh, I was able to get uh, $1.8 million that I split between – Whittier and the city of La Mirada. Now, the city of La Mirada, they wanted to renovate their performing arts center uh, and their performing arts theater. So I got them $400,000 that they needed to do that. Nice. Uh, Now, in Whittier, uh, the city needed $1.4 million uh, to do a bunch of renovations at all our local parks. So Lee Owens Park, uh, Laurel Park, Gerardo Park, Palm Park, Joe Miller Field, the Greenway Trail. those are all now going to happen because of the $1.4 million that I was able to get in the state budget. So the, the Greenway Trail now is going to be lit. There's no lights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be lit from five points all the way up to Hadley. So it's about two miles. That's what yeah. the city wanted to do. So they're going to light it and put lights up right there. Um, and you know all these other parks, whether it's building new bathroom or updating facilities or whatever, things that have just gone by the wayside for so long because there's just not been that extra money to do it, are now going to be funded because I was able to bring the money back uh, from the state and I uh, handed them a check a couple nights ago. And so they're going to be uh, now working on all these all these updates. And so that's the type of stuff that I focus on because that's real talent, tangible value yeah. and benefit to the people that live here in Whittier and, and in all the areas that I represent. I mean, last year I got $750,000 for the city of La Puente so that they can build a skate park. Nice. And so they're just finishing all the plans and they're going to be building a skate park. Um, Norwalk, I got them $2 million for the renovation of the Excelsior uh, Gymnasium and Auditorium, Mm -hmm. which doesn't just benefit the school. It benefits that community and all surrounding communities. That's that's where all the graduations are. (laughs) Exactly. That's where everybody uses it. So I got them $2 million to renovate that. And um, so I've really, especially since I've become majority leader, have uh, used every tool at my disposal to try and bring as much back to this community. And one other thing that I do every year, I do a lot of different things, but the one that I'm most proud of is my college and career fair, where we bring all the top colleges and universities um, and companies uh, to uh, usually a school in in La Puente or in Hacienda Heights because I partner with the Hacienda La Puente Unified School District on this college and career fair. Uh, And we get 1,000 kids from my district to show up. And they have access to Harvard, Yale, USC, UCLA, all the big schools, Ivy League schools, so that they can get information about how they can 
attend these schools. And we're talking, I mean, we do this in La Puente. That's the poorest community in the San Gabriel Valley. And you're talking to kids that never thought they could ever even attend a school like that. Right. And then they bring their parents. Well, guess what? We also have workshops and classes that talk about financial support yeah. and financial aid and give them all the information. I can't tell you how many times I've had parents come up to me and say, thank you so much. I've been te- deathly terrified to have this conversation with my child about not being able to pay for them to go to school. And now I just found out I can have access to all this different financial aid yeah. because you know the different income thresholds or whatever, and I can get them support that they need to go to the school of their dreams. I mean, that's, that's the value of my position and what I do is bringing that back. I mean, we also, in terms of the job market, you know, we bring a lot, there's a lot of different jobs where you can make a lot of money, whether it's a, being a nurse. Um, I had Tesla out there um, talking to kids about working for Tesla, whether it's, you know, as an engineer or, you know, sales or whatever. Um, you know, we have a lot of different unions that come and, you know, talk about, you know, okay, if you're, if you, become an operating engineer, you can make eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year doing this type of work as an operating engineer and you don't need a college education. And, and so it's a lot of that. Yeah. Um a, a lot of that that we do at the that the college and career fair. My staff puts a lot of time and energy into it. And then we hand out scholarships. You know, we hand out we do an essay contest where we hand out to four I think five people this year we did a thousand dollars. Nice. You know, we do a bunch of two hundred fifty dollar gift cards to Barnes and Noble so you can get, you know, books, books and stuff. Yeah. So it's a huge benefit, and that's really important uh, that elected officials do it. And this is the largest college and career fair in this area, hands down. When is it normally? It's uh, usually in September. September. And and that's huge because you're talking about, like, um, aside from making it a resource for the community, you're just doubling down on getting a bigger return on what you're going to get out of the community. So you're right. You You might get, you know, a few doctors several nurses, a bunch of engineers, you know, a bunch of teachers um, that then would go out, serve their profession. But guess what? They'll still come back to their community and give back. Absolutely. Um, and, again, you, the little amount of investment you put into this is just going to, you know, triple, quadruple back in terms of what it's doing. So it's awesome that there's resources, and obviously you guys put that effort to, to do something like that because it's huge, man. It's very huge. And going through the financial aid system myself, I mean, I went through many years of college, and being an immigrant, my parents that worked out every day, they didn't have time to go to the financial aid office and actually get the information. And if they even got the information, it's, it's very confusing. But if there was a one-day event that they know – this is the day as opposed to go to the financial aid office mm-hmm. any day from nine to one. No one is going to do that. So, um, and it was, there was me more navigating through it and we made probably mistakes and did everything incorrectly. And then towards the end of it, then I learned and then it's, you know, it, it, it became easier, but initially it was, it was pretty confusing. <laughs> no, for sure. And that, and that's the point is to simplify it and make it really easily digestible yeah. for a lot of people. I mean, yeah. we get a thousand kids. That's just the students. And we even had some middle school kids showing up for yeah. this. Uh, but we get a, t- we had a ton of parents, nice. a ton of parents that get a lot of really valuable information. Very cool. Very cool. So what, what else you got going on here in Whittier that you've, uh, or, or surrounding cities that you've kind of worked on? Or, or maybe working on. I mean, is there any future plans? Yeah. So, I mean, I work on a lot of different things. You know, one of the things that I also try to do is um, I really care about, you know, arts education and uh, arts funding. And, and so when I first got elected, I chaired the Committee on Arts, Entertainment, Sports, Tourism, and Internet Media. And, uh, you know, at the time when I got elected, the state's contribution to arts education funding was about a million dollars. And then there were other things that would... You know, we got a federal match, and so all told, it was about $5 million, but the state was only putting in about a million. Um, well, I thought that that was criminal. For the whole state? For the whole state. Wow. <laughs> um, that we had so little investment in arts education funding. You're talking orchestra, band, dance, art classes, all these types of, you know, shop. All, that's all arts funding. Um, and a lot of these got cut, especially after the recession. And so... We were able to bring it up, the state's contribution, from $1 million to about $15 million, where it's at right now, but all told with all the other money that we bring in. Because the federal government, they also got rid of the match. They got rid of the federal match. Um, and, uh, and so now it's about $25 million. 
of arts education funding that we have wow. uh, throughout, throughout the state. And so one of the things that I do is a lot of local schools, you know, I, I've done this in La Mirada, Norwalk, Whittier, um, uh, is uh, Barona, they, they do this grant, the Barona Band of Mission Indians, they're down in the San Diego area, uh, where I can uh, submit a school for consideration where we can get $5,000 to go directly to the school to help them buy supplies, whether it's band equipment, art supplies, whatever that they, that school might need. And recently we just did um, um, uh, a Femineers program of young women engineers hmm. uh, nice. program uh, in the Norwalk area. And it's a huge deal because they, I mean, these are programs that have just no supplies, no, mm-hmm. no, no funding. Uh, but yet we need more women to become engineers and to be in these positions. Yeah. And so to be able to get $5,000, although it doesn't sound like a lot for a small program of you know 20 kids or so, that's a huge, that's a huge deal. Yeah. And so I've been working on a lot of that type of stuff, and I just kind of keep my ear to the ground on whatever's happening locally that I can be a part of. Uh, and then also – now, my legislation, you know, I author a lot of legislation um, that have different effects. You know, I did a bill I was talking about earlier as at a, uh, East Whittier uh, School District. Um, they, they do a parent symposium. You know, I was just talking about financial literacy and how important financial literacy is for, for kids uh, to have that knowledge when they graduate high school. And uh, I passed a bill two years ago that required two years of financial literacy in elementary school, two years in middle school, and two years in high school. Um, now, I was given an eight-year implementation by the state uh, and the Board of Education to get that implemented, so we're still a couple of years out of it being implemented. Uh, but that, that type of stuff I care a lot about. Um, and so, you know, just continuing to work on, it, uh, on legislation. And, you know, this year we're going to continue to work on blockchain technology because I, wanna, I, want, I want us to be able to utilize that technology as a state because I think there are a lot of benefits to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll look at AI, artificial intelligence, and, Every facet of artificial intelligence um, um, and how it's impacting our daily lives uh, and making sure that there are proper regulations yeah. around AI because, you know, you have some companies right now that are just going full, full board on creating this artificial intelligence. And if we get some type of autonomously thinking uh, artificial intelligence into our network, there's no taking that back. And then they control it. It controls everything. Yeah. Uh, and so there's no regulation on that. And so we need to make sure that there's regulation. So I'll be working on that and a whole other host of issues. Very cool. Very cool. Um, now we're going to get into into more Whittier stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the toughest questions of the day today. Yeah. Well, actually, they'll be easy for you because you live here. So it's going to. Well, tough because you're going to make someone really happy or you make other people <laughs> not as happy. So when you're not in uh, Sacramento, maybe not in Uptown, or maybe, maybe you are in Uptown or not surfing, if you were to come and have a bite to eat in, in let's say, the Woodier area, what are some of your favorite go-to spots? Oh, man, I go all over the place. Um, I, like, I love California Grill. I go there all the time. Um, I love Lascari's. I go to Lascari's all the time. The from one Lambert off, or off Whittier? Lambert. Uh-huh. I, I, I used to live on the other side of Whittier, and so I used to go to the one off Whittier Boulevard, but now mm-hmm. I go to the one off Lambert. I may occasionally visit Popeye's yeah. <laughs> or Del Taco or Taco Bell. We won't tell the wife. We won't tell her. You're good. Our secret's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, Charburger right here. Uh, 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 off Greenleaf, I, I go there. All, I was there last night. <laughs> Oh man, I'm totally blowing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I've been to you know the Rusty Monk, and I mean, I I, I try to you know be as adventurous as possible. But uh, you know, I spend a lot of time also going to the the Ralphs down the street so we can cook and make nice. tacos and spaghetti. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, and if you were um, if you would like to see something in Woodier that it maybe is not here, what would that be? So. You know, we're getting in and out. My wife is really excited about that. That's right. Mm-hmm. Really excited about that. Uh, I'm sure she'd love to see a Target closer. We have one at the other yeah. side of Whittier. I'm sure she'd yeah. love to see one, a big box retailer at this side. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I'd love to see kind of like a, um, a more entertainment complex uh, in Whittier. I mean, look, we have Whittier College right here, but it's. Um, I, I just don't feel like there's, you know, you have an Irvine, you have an Irvine Spectrum, or yeah. you know, in Tustin, you have the Americana, and, and so, I mean, not in Tustin, uh, not in Tustin, but um, Glendale, uh, Glendale, yeah. Um, and in Tustin, you also have, you know, it's a big shopping the center, so, the marketplace. So I, I, 
I would love to see, you know, I love Whittier Village Cinemas. Um, I, I've grown up going to movies at Whittier Village Cinemas, but it'd be cool to see kind of like a Sinopolis. They have one in Pico, but to have like a Sinopolis here with some type of, you know, something here in Uptown, I think it would be really cool, or just something in Whittier where there's just more. Because uh, part of the problem that we have here in Whittier is a lot of people leave uh, to go to the movies, to go eat at a lot of restaurants and stuff. Uh, and so we lose a lot of revenue because of that. The city lives, lives, loses a lot of revenue. So it would be really cool if we could build more entertainment-type spaces, which we are getting um, um, the um, – oh, my God. What's it called? It's in Anaheim. The um, Packing house. Packing house. We're getting a mm-hmm. packing house-esque type. Like Poet Gardens. Yeah, uh, over here uh, at the new development that Brookfield's right. doing. Oh. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and um, – was it? It's called the Grow. So I mean, we are getting a packing house type thing, which is cool. But I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see more of that uh, in Whittier. And then I, you know, of course, I'd love to see more park space. I think more park space would be cool. See, I thought you were gonna go like straight for like we're gonna get a wave machine somewhere like in Uptown <laughs> <laughs> and uh, bring the yeah. ocean to. Believe me, I'd, I'd love, I'd, I'd love that. I'd be there every day. If people find me. We got the skate park already. I we mean, got the skate park right there. I know. Fill that with That's water. And- <laughs> That's another thing too. Most people don't even realize. But you know, remember how the courthouse was closed down for a while? Uh-huh. I worked for five years to reopen that, and we just reopened it this That's year. Right. I worked for five years to reopen that, and the county came in. They're like, "We're only opening this because we know it's important to you, and you've you've been on us every day." And so, the more the once they were able to get more funding, we were able to reopen that courthouse, and it's a huge benefit to Uptown Whittier because a lot of the people. So that's family law now, not criminal. Correct. So that's you know kind of marriage issues, custody, and that type of stuff. Um, but when when there's downtime, they come here to Uptown, and they are patrons at up local businesses. Because I think it was a hit, and I know it was a hit to a lot of local businesses when that courthouse shut down. But now that's reopened, bring it brings new business in, and so those are the types of things that I really have been focusing a lot on, and that are huge, uh, significant boons to our community. And the economy, really. I mean, yeah, local you're economy. right. I mean, it, it, when that opened up, I mean, I forget how many law offices popped up. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the ones that we have here now uh, grew in size. Uh, so, again, talking about how you impact a, a community locally, I mean, that's that's big. That's huge. It's huge to a point where people are complaining about parking now. Yeah. So, that's right. That's, so a signal. Yeah. that's a signal, right? When you, you're, you're having parking issues, then you're doing a good thing. Well, they need to remember <laughs> the uh, parking structure. Right, right. Well, everybody loves to pick park right here off off of uh, Greenleaf. Yeah, you know it's cool. Or, yeah, but the parking structure usually is pretty open. Yeah, yeah. I find that's right. Yeah. That's parking right. structure only takes cash, so that's the problem. For that is a problem. Well, yeah, you know, and it's a big problem for millennials because I know for me, I never have cash. Right? Yeah. Can I Venmo you? I know <laughs> Venmo. I do Venmo. That's how yeah. I pay for my yeah, haircuts. Exactly. You know, I got uh, Art Quayar down at uh, Tradition Barber Shop down in East Whittier. He, he does my haircuts and. Um, you know, it's, I always Venmo him. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I, I, I'm a, I Venmo my manicurist as well. That's yeah. funny. Um, but so this is our last Whittier question. And since you are like, you know, a Whittier townie and you grew up here, what's one thing from Whittier's past that you kind of miss from, you know, those good old days? Oh, I miss Little League at Murphy Ranch. Oh, I miss it so much. Uh, opening day, laying out my uniform the day before. Nice. You know, because the baseball season was starting. I love baseball. Huge Dodger fan devastated still that they lost the world series i don't want to talk about it <laughs> um have a drink how, yeah. long, <laughs> how long were you um did you do little league oh i did it for a couple of years I, I mean I, I don't remember gosh i mean I, I did it up until high school um and i played baseball up until high school but i, I mean just playing at murphy ranch was really fun i those are some of the best memories i'll, I'll always have yeah. um you know one thing i don't miss is you know driving by Nellis and my dad saying, if you don't behave, we're gonna, I'm going to drop you <laughs> off there. <laughs> you know, I, I was always, you know, I, I was, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was serious. <laughs> yeah. you know. Throw you over that yeah, 15-foot yeah. fence. You know, don't, hey, I, you know, I know the warden there. Yeah. I'll drop you off. Don't think I won't. Uh, so I sure a lot of kids growing up don't miss that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, 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 love growing, I love growing up here and, and uh, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's home. Yeah. Well, well, Amen to well that. like, what's that one thing you, you're, you're like saving for your kids when they get a little older to tell? Man, I remember when we used to, you know. Oh, like, okay. So, um, my my dad, he still lives in the same house I was brought home from the hospital to. No way. Uh, and that's up in Rose Hills, Spyglass. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, just above the the cemetery. Yeah. 
and uh, me and my brother Matt, uh, along with our neighbor, uh, his name was Kyle Ridgell. Uh, his name is Kyle Ridgell. I just haven't seen him in a long time. Uh, we would hop over the fence and go and play in the canyon. Now, parents didn't usually know that. Of course. <laughs> now they know, right? Now they know. <laughs> uh, but we would go and find courts and just like pick up courts, you know, and, and just kind of traverse all the, and the cement gutters. I don't know what else you would call them that they, they have. And, you know, we used to go and walk down there all the time. And, you know, that kind of stopped when we learned that there was a mountain lion. Yeah. <laughs> Coyotes and volcanoes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And- we didn't really realize that when, when we were doing it, but oh my god, it was so much fun. Right, um, and yeah, you know, we found huge quartz, and you know, my drive my dad nuts because you know, bringing them in, we're cleaning them in the sink and yeah. putting them all over the place. <laughs> They're diamonds, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> diamonds. <laughs> we're rich. <laughs> I'm gonna retire you. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in that uh, in that canyon. No. So are you letting uh, your your one year old eventually go in that same? It's not without me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's one of the, right. It's one of those things where like, oh man, I hope my kid never does this. But at the same time, you're like, man, if I didn't do it as a kid, imagine where I where I would be. You know? Yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, it was a huge part of my life. I mean, yeah. every opportunity we had, we were we were in that canyon. Nice, nice. Or skateboarding out front of the house. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Bring a canyon, a surf place. Uh, and then integrate it all together, all at one. Right. Becomes a park. <laughs> there you go. Done. Well, thank you for uh, coming yes. on. Uh, appreciate you uh, giving us some time to to uh, come on. And if, if someone wants to uh, connect with your campaign and just get a hold of you, what's the best way of uh, connecting with you? So uh, all my information is online. So there's you know my campaign, which is separate from my state office. If you have a state issue, uh, you know you need help with something, I recommend you calling my state office. If you just Google my name, Ian Calderon, um, my assembly website will pop up. It's got my capital office information. It's got my district office information. You can either call or show up, and you can talk to my staff in that office. And then, you know, my campaign, I have a campaign website, uh, enccalderon.com, and, you know, people can go there if they want to leave a message or get in contact with somebody. Got it. And are you on social media? or? Yeah, I am. So I have my Twitter. So my campaign Twitter is at Ian Calderon. My uh, my official um, assembly member Twitter is at Ian A D fifty seven. Um, I'm on Instagram at Ian Calderon, um, and uh, Facebook. I have a campaign Facebook and a state Facebook one. You know, the state ones majority leader Ian C Calderon. So. Uh, if you just go, I, I mean, it'll all pop up. It's pretty easy to find. <laughs> Christine is uh, typing away there, and she'll put them in the show notes so people can click on them. It'll be a little, a little easier. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And we wish you the best on your re-election. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate the time. Thank right. you. Bye, Woodier. See you later, Woodier. <laughs>